the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from Neglected Aspects of Sufi Study by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. Sufis study in Sufism, and matters about Sufism, if dealt with at all, must involve the minimum of their attention. The reverse is true of externalist scholars. The scholars say that they are objective and that the Sufi is subjective. The Sufi says that nobody who does not see the whole picture can be objective that the person who tries to assume an objective posture is unable to do so until he has had the experiences which alone grant objectivity. From the point of view of the Sufi, the scholars, and similar, approaches are inadequate. From the viewpoint of the externalist, the Sufi is dealing in capricious things and is inefficient and inconsistent in saying that he will only teach something which will have an effect not the whole corpus of materials. Their positions have already been defined and explained into Alia by Ghazali almost a thousand years ago. To continue faithful to my claim that we will deal to the greatest possible extent with what will help those who are genuinely interested, rather than with those who have inner reasons for not learning, we must leave the discussion and information element here or we would be in danger of becoming argumentative philosophers rather than workers in the field of greater human development. The next part of this exposition will deal with the problems which Sufis find in conveying the truth of their experiences and how these are solved. We can prepare for this by noting two of them. The first is that when people have an overriding interest, a preoccupation, this may have to be solved before they can study Sufism. Someone, for instance, who says, Why are Sufis not involved in political action? Is clearly interested in political action and should stick to it until Sufism becomes more interesting to him or her or until he or she becomes so really dedicated to political action or anything else that Sufism is not a real interest anymore. When the mind is full of established biases, it will not be able to graft Sufism on top of them. I will end with the poem of Rumi to this effect, and you will see its equivalence to the way which things about obsession, conditioning and preconceptions are put in more modern language. Two insects eat from the same place, but from one is a sting and the other honey. Both kinds of deer have the same grazing and water, from one dung the other musk. Each of two canes feeds from one thing. This one is empty, the other full of sugar. It is not our experience that people in the East can always understand Sufism better than in the West. At the same time, even in educational circles in the West, the influence of the commercial society perhaps has produced attitudes which inhibit learning capacity, that of Sufism included. The example which has struck me most forcibly is connected with assumptions about what one is to teach and what ground this is to cover. I continually receive requests from schools, colleges, universities and learned and social bodies of all kinds asking for lectures. People want to know about Sufism. In several hundred such cases I have replied saying that I will happily lecture providing that the audience will first familiarise itself with the basic information about Sufism which is to be obtained from books. I say this because it seems quite absurd to me for a lot of people to collect and to listen to someone repeating something which has been written down and can be assimilated by reading. If people are indeed interested, it is not to be expected that they will be prepared to familiarise themselves with what has been written and then ask someone to talk to them on more advanced or extra aspects, and also to answer questions based on the fundamental reading. 
You may be interested to know that out of these some hundreds of approaches between 1964 and 1974, only one organisation ever agreed to ask its audience to do the basic reading. What does this show? It may show that people want to exercise curiosity, what is this man like? Or that they do not believe that you can get anything from books, though I have written books on the subject and what were those for? It cannot be that the students can understand only if spoken to, and not through the written word. If that were so, they would probably be so backward that there would be little point in addressing them anyway. Such people exist, too, in the East, but they tend to be found most often among those who have been exposed to Western-style advertising, where the feeling is engendered that something can be obtained or enjoyed by what they imagine to be the easiest course in this case, by listening. What makes this all the more interesting is the nature of the reactions. Some people have become quite annoyed with me for asking them to get to know something of the subject first, as if they were hiring me to do their work for them. In fact, one or two have actually said such things as, why should our people read when you can tell them? I am afraid that they become even more annoyed when I ask why anyone should give a talk on, say, beekeeping to people who could not understand words. How far back do we go? Others say, as if it made any difference to the discussion, the presence of the personality makes all the difference. Difference to what? Basic facts about Sufism do not need a personality to convey them. Sufism, in education, needs the sort of audience which will be able to attend to what the Sufi and Sufism say. The block, which Sufis call the veil, which people or human modes of thought interpose between the knowledge and themselves, can effectively mean that at times and in places there is nobody to tell. The anwar e suhaili puts it thus, Do not offer the mystery to everyone, for in this centre of earth we have travelled enough, and there was no helper of the secrets. The study of Sufism requires a trained observer. In the Western scientific and literary scholastic traditions, certain minimum capacities are demanded before the observer, student or researcher can be said to be capable of carrying on his investigations. Naturally, these qualifications help in two ways. First, they help to assure others that the observations are likely to be good and sensible. Secondly, they are the tools which enable the worker to explore his theme and profit from it. In Sufism, exactly the same criteria apply. The investigation of Sufism has to be carried out by someone who is himself qualified by having the background which will enable him to research the right phenomena, at the right time, in the right place enable him to experience what he has encountered, and, ideally, enable him to render this in a communicable form to others. You do not do the watchmaker's job with the bootmaker's tools, and an admirable nuclear physicist may make a very indifferent mechanic or philosopher. Scientific training is needed for scientific investigations. Sufi training is needed for the exploration and understanding of Sufism. This simple fact is obscured by the unconscious assumption that current intellectual and scientific approaches are suitable for all studies, even, perhaps, that they are better than any others, even, perhaps, that the thing being observed cannot itself be assumed to have methods and procedures which have been designed for observing it. We should, however, not be too hasty. Western observers started by looking at outside and backward peoples and histories before they started to analyse themselves with their own tools. Some sort of a hangover of this attitude may be present in the failure to grasp too readily that a thing may already have its own science, and a visible one. The great poet Hafiz has spoken of the approach by diligent study of the ordinary sort as being impossible as have so many of the other Sufi masters. Only the bird perceives the rose totally, as not everyone who reads a leaf knows its meaning, 
O you who from the book of reason would see the signs of love, I fear that you cannot fathom this subtlety by research. The Sufi study methods involve a preparation of the psychology of the learner's mind by a variety of methods, which must correspond with his or her mental set and the condition of subjective characteristics. The conditioned or immature self which tends to control him and makes further progress impossible until it has been brought into subjection, set aside or transformed. Some methods are publicly known, but their devising and application depends upon many factors and is so finely tuned that there is no point in trying to adopt them from books as devotional exercises and so on. Sufism is studied by means of itself. Some people answer, but why should I study it in order to find out if it is any use to me? The answer to this, of course, is simply, there is no reason why you should do so unless you want to, this desire being based on what you read and what you hear about it. The children of the consumer society are accustomed to asking, why should I do this or that, and being told that it is, because it will make you bigger, calmer, richer, happier, more successful, and so on. And so they frame their questions in this way. And consequently, by the hard sell or the soft sell, they either buy or refuse to buy. But the Sufi materials are not put in this way at all. On the contrary, we find that it is generally only when people have got over this phase of expecting something greater for themselves that they are able to learn in Sufism. There is, of course, the so-called third way of dealing with things, discussion. In this, it is held, the purpose is not to buy or to sell a system or idea, but to have it out, work the thing through by discussion. People insist that if you do not discuss with them, you must be paranoid. This holds good, however, only when we are working in a field where discussion is in fact useful. It is interesting to note that many people who are full of Sufi arguments taken from books and supposedly Sufi circles have failed to register the many passages in the teaching which say such things as someone being saved from drowning does not ask your parentage. It is a matter, as in all educational situations, of what is relevant. Discussion is useful only in matters requiring discussion. It may be of less value when it is only a matter of someone who insists on discussion, needed or otherwise, the need to discuss. An instance comes to mind, admittedly an exaggerated case, but after all it is the more pronounced varieties of diseases which are used for illustration purposes. A man came to see me and said, If I go to Oxford and get a doctorate of philosophy, I can end up as the head of the BBC. What equivalent can Sufism offer? Please note that he had not even registered that there is only one head of the BBC, and plenty of PhDs and even Oxford D. Phils are nowadays tending hamburger stalls. He was an intelligent man with a good position in life, but as he could only think in terms of the consumer society, and in terms of rank and power, and presumably what he imagined might be happiness, I could only say, Brother, we have nothing whatever to offer you. Now, as far as I can find out, he is quite happy, having concluded that Sufism does not offer anything that he might have been missing. The possible role of Sufi attitudes in education, particularly in the contemporary world, seems distinctly to be in making clear in such terms as these that we are living in a world where certain orientations, such as those just described, are so common that we don't know that we are their prisoner. Sufis hold that there is all the difference in the world between your ambition commanding you and you commanding it. I am sure that, now that so many human difficulties have been surmounted, Man and womankind is in a position to give attention to those possibilities of human flexibility which previously had no cash value and hence were underdeveloped.
One of the most useful extrapolations from Sufic experiences which are usable on ordinary study levels are what we call teaching stories. Several hundred of these are now in print in Western languages, assembled from the classics, from oral tradition and also specially written for present-day cultures. Their impact and value has been very extensive. By familiarising readers with concepts which they had not considered before, the stories have been appreciated as an educational tool in psychology and also in general education. Many, for instance, are in use both for schools and in teacher training courses. These materials have also been adopted for improving thinking methods and for relating various concepts in a manner which was previously found difficult or impossible by various kinds of experts, including workers even in physics. We have found the stories useful in confirming feelings which people already had, but did not know how to relate to thinking patterns. One actual teaching function of the tales lies in having people select the ones they like and the ones they understand, and then discarding these to work for the time being with the remainder. This is, of course, the reversal of the usual method when people tend to concentrate upon what attracts them in any material, including religious materials, and working with that. By making the person attend not just to selected stories or things which impress him most, but upon the whole range of the stories, we are able to prepare areas of his thinking which he would generally neglect. Successive depths and levels in interpretation of the stories signal an increasing development of awareness and make it possible to understand at once the stage arrived at by the student and to do further work with him. We find that the range and variety of the stories are most useful in dealing with many of the victims of misinformation who have recently started to adopt emotional forms of Sufism from books and certain Middle East cultists. Because the stories cover such a range, and because many of them come from such authorities as Ghazali and Rumi, who are at least notionally accepted by these people, they are able to widen their vision and, often, ultimately to escape from the near-clinical states of excitement and depression in which they have so often spent a great deal of time. The repertoire of Sufi tales and their content and versatility are almost infinite. Sufi knowledge can be furthered, and traditionally as at present is furthered, by the application of impacts. Here tales and encounters merge. Sometimes this takes the form of introducing incongruities which make the individual think or make his mind work in another, sharper and clearer fashion. Sometimes it is necessary to redeem the jaded awareness first. This technique, too, can be used and is employed in a contemporary context. The most familiar technique is that of jokes. In the Mullah Nasruddin corpus, in addition to the structures which the jokes embrace, which is something else, the blow administered by the joke makes possible a transitory condition in which other things can be perceived. The fact often noted by book reviewers that many Nasruddin stories are not jokes at all, is also part of the total technique. The intention here is to prevent the stabilisation of this form of humour into funny things and those which are not funny. The Nasruddin story is intended to be unexpected. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.